in the Old Testament, they had the temple. The antithesis of that in the New Testament is the temple is in heaven. Or we, the people of God, are the temple of the living God. But it's not a physical temple. We have to be preaching the truth regarding the end times. And the truth about that is that our doctrines of end times and of the millennium and of the Antichrist and of the Great Tribulation and of the Rapture are totally, totally unscriptural. And all of us who were taught those doctrines would find it hard to hear somebody say it's all unscriptural. And we say that because it's been proven to be unscriptural as one has continued researching the whole situation year in and year out. And it's not easy to let God change our minds. But we need to follow the truth. And the truth is that those doctrines come from a Gnostic. Now this is strange because most of our churches are against Gnosticism. And we all have learned that John the Apostle, when he wrote his letters, was preaching against the Gnosticism that was coming into the church then. It's taken our churches by storm. Through the teaching of that Gnostic, John Nelson Darby, who said he got a revelation from God about it all, and that was a lie, because he really copied what a Jesuit priest in the 16th century had first declared and written a book about, which of course was the Jewish myth. This Jesuit priest was a Jewish, was a Jew. A Jew started the Jesuits. And then, sometime later, another Jesuit, Jewish, uh, wrote another book about the whole subject and John Nelson Darby just copied their ideas. They were Gnostics. It was their ideas. They had the revelation. They said, but of course their revelation was from Satan. And they would have known because they were Kabbalists and followed the Talmud and the Kabbalah as the Jews and Judaism and Israel does today. So when we understand that, we then have to reorganize our thinking and allow the Word of God itself to teach us. Now a lot of people say, oh yes, I get it right because the Holy Spirit's teaching me. I've had people say that to me and I want to say, you can't rely on that. How do you know what you are thinking is from the Holy Spirit? How do you know that what, you are, what conclusions you are coming to is from the Holy Ghost? You do not know unless the Word of God plainly declares it. So it all remains on this. We have to understand what the Word of God is saying. Now I will say this as a start. It is important that we get this matter right. Because we have our churches filled with Zionism and doctrines of demons in this regard. Now when you look at the scriptures, at the Old Testament and the New Testament, you have an antithesis. The Old Testament is around the natural Israel around the natural people of God, around a natural Abraham who actually lived a godly life from childhood. If you read the other books of the Bible that are missing, there's wonderful stories about Abraham. How that even from a child of three years old he began to seek the Lord. When his whole family were following heathendom, and their idols 
when his whole city did. Here's little Abraham. Now I accept that because at two years of age my spiritual awakening happened. So a three-year-old as Abraham can have spiritual awakening and he had a far stronger spiritual awakening than I did because I was in a godly home and he was not. So you go through the Old Testament, it all concerns the nations round about it. It concerns their natural walk. But when you come to the New Testament, the antithesis of that is, when you read it, it's a spiritual people of God. No earthly people of God. It's a spiritual situation. We're led by the Holy Spirit who indwells us. The Holy Ghost didn't indwell them in the Old, Old Testament. They were moved by the Holy Ghost. We're not moved by the Holy Ghost. We're filled with the Holy Ghost. The antithesis. In the Old Testament, they had the temple. The antithesis of that in the New Testament is the temple is in heaven, or we, the people of God, are the temple of the living God, but it's not a physical temple. If you go to a church full of hundreds of people who are really born again, who are really in the Spirit of God, you see them, here's part of the temple of the living God. Here's part of the temple of Jesus Christ. He being the chief cornerstone. But what do you see? You don't see a building. You see natural people, but they're natural people who've been born again, and their kingdom is the kingdom of God and of heaven, not the kingdom of this earth. Nothing of this earth belongs to their kingdom. This teaching of prosperity is demonic. It is not part of the teaching of the kingdom of God and of heaven. So in the New Testament, you have the new household of God. You have the new nation of Israel. The old nation of Israel, its antithesis, finished, ended. No more exists. No more to exist forever. Forever. Because the new Israel of God has come. And you cannot call that replacements theology because it's a continuation of the people of God who were in the nation of Israel who really look forward to the coming of Christ. We're a continuation of them in this sense. Christ has come. They're joined to Christ. We look back at the cross of Jesus Christ whereas they looked forward to something we look back to the cross of Jesus Christ. We look back, Christ has come, but he has joined us to them. It says so in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. So I'm not preaching replacement theology. I'm replacing continuation theology and saying it as the Bible says it. Because it says in Galatians chapter 6, 16, chapter 6, 16 we are the... Israel of God, who have been circumcised according to the Spirit and not circumcised according to the flesh. So we have an antithesis. Now what does that really mean? It really means this, that we are in a spiritual walk. We have now an accoutrement or an, an, an armor of spiritual weapons, we are participating in the power of the age to come. They didn't in old Israel. They participated in the acts of that power to come, who performed them through his prophets or kings or in response to his own will or to, in response to the prayers of those people like Hezekiah who really prayed to him. So they had natural enemies. Of course behind those natural enemies were the spiritual enemies. And because 
our churches are neglecting books of the Bible that should be there, we fail to understand very much that we should be understanding. Now behind those enemies of Israel in the Old Testament were the continuation of the watchers or the fallen angels, the continuation of their descendants, their spirits, and their natural creations of, of, of giants that had been born, the natural progeny that really were the spirit progeny that inhabited certain uh, chief people down through the centuries that opposed the nation of Israel in a natural way, but behind them and in them were those spirit forces that were not spiritual because they were not of the Holy Ghost. They were evil spirit forces. And in our church system today, we have definitely a system. You have the organized churches everywhere. Oh, how organized. Oh, how human. I know, I've been in them, pastored them, preached in them, follow the system. You have the Roman Catholic system. That is an antichrist system. You have the denominations that work out to be an antichrist system. There's demons in those denominations. There's demons in the Roman Catholic Church. There's demons working in our churches through the preachers who may be our watchers or the descendants of the giants. Oh yes, we have them. They had them in the early church. And we won't go into that just now. But what we need to realize is that you get this Gnosticism and the Gnosticism in the church wants to interpret the book of Revelation in a Gnostic way, which is a natural way, which is a way according to myth. We have to interpret it in a spiritual way. How can we do that? Because we say we are led by the Spirit? No. We have to say that, one, the Holy Spirit teaches us, yes. He teaches many of the others. But basically, we, we have to have our understanding redirected and directed totally by the words of the scriptures themselves. That is our base. Now the base of the end timers is the Gnosticism of John Nelson Darby and the Jesuit priests. We had to leave that and see what the Bible says. And of course it's spiritual. We have to understand we're in a spiritual situation now, even though we're living here, even though there are wars and famines and martyrdoms and, and uh, poverty and evil against the poor. It's all with us. But we have to stand as spiritual people who understand by the Holy Spirit from the Word of God what the book of Revelation is all about. Because most of the book of Revelation is about a visible people. It's about the people in relation to the city of Jerusalem and in relation to the nation of Israel and their enemy, the Roman Empire. They all fall. The foretelling is in this book. But then we have the spiritual scene and the spiritual side. And we need to understand the natural side and, and the spiritual side and where they are divided. So today, we have a holy people of God spread amongst all the denominations who to, uh, to many are invisible. We cannot see the visibility of the holiness of those people of God. We see the actions that are holy of the people of God. 
but their holiness to us is invisible, we cannot see. We cannot see their righteousness. We see their holy acts, we see their righteous acts. And without righteous acts and holy acts, where is one's Christianity? Do you know that I think it's in the book of Enoch, where it says that in, in the end of time, the Lord weighs the doings, the actions, the works of the believers. Now that's rather solemn, because we're just all taught, yes, you're born again, you have heaven, you definitely get to heaven. Forget about, and forget to be told, he who endures to the end shall be saved. And without works, faith is dead. There have to be not the natural works, but the works of the Holy Spirit in and through us that are displayed somewhere to some people in a visible action that we are performing in our bodies and with our bodies and with our hands and with our feet and with our tongues and with our ears and with our eyes and with our taste. So you have the visibly seen, very visible people of the old Israel of God. And when you see that this new Israel of God is a spiritual entity, that it's an organism, you cannot see the members of the organism as they are in the organism, because that's invisible. We see the visibility of the members who are displaying uh, the fact that they are in the organism by their holy living, by their love of the Lord, and by the operation of the Word of God in their lives and through their mouths, and by the operation of the Spirit of God as they are in the body of Christ. And so when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we see that what we have today is the body of Christ. Now I'm one of those who believe you're not performing or acting in the body of Christ unless you are filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues and operating gifts of the Holy Ghost. And that does not mean you're always operating gifts of healing because most of the time you will not be doing so. There are other gifts of the Spirit. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, Just as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the men that is of the body form one body, so also is Christ. So we are part of the body of Christ. This is Christ. He's the head. We're the members of the body. Now when you read the rest of those verses, you'd, nowhere does it say any of us is the head. Someone is the eye, someone is something else. It doesn't say anywhere that any person is the mind or any per person is the heart or any person is any faculty of the mind because it is not. It is spiritual and supernatural even though it's acting out with our natural body in what even would appear sometimes to be a natural way. And then it says, for that, that also is Christ. Now that me able to say, I am Christ. We can say this, Christ is the head and we are part of his body and the Bible says, this is Christ. He's the head and he has a body on earth and that body is us. Can you see Christ? Invisible. Can you see inside of us that is joined to Christ? You cannot. Because our bodies are not joined to Christ. Our bodies are not part of the Christ's body. Our spirits are. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 
verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that whoever is joined to a prostitute is one body? For God says the two will become one flesh. But whoever who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So what the apostle is saying there is that even our bodies are personally are affected by the spiritual action that has happened within us. Because the spiritual action happened through our bodies because we're living here. But it is not in the body itself. It's not in our flesh that still remains carnal. But as it says in Romans chapter 14, present your bodies a living sacrifice to God. You see? Our, the fact that we are believers doesn't make it that our, automatically that our bodies never sin. He says, present your body to God. We don't have to present our spirit to God because our spirit is already joined to Christ. Now, I cannot see the spirit in you joined to Christ. I can see the actions of your body. I know the spirit in you is joined to Christ because I can see your body. And I can see, moreover, not so much your body as the holiness that your body performs. You don't join yourself to a prostitute. Therefore, you don't join yourself to heathendom, or this world, or the Jews, or Israel, or Judaism. You don't prostitute yourself. You do that with your bodies, but you can't do it with your spirit. Your spirit is pure and holy. You know why? Because it says, for God says, the two will become one flesh, that's the prostitute and, and the, the adulterer, but, who, but whoever, who, it says, but whoever, who, is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Now the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ is pure. So the spirit of you that is joined to the Lord Jesus Christ is pure. That's how you go to heaven. If you hadn't been born again and had that recreation of the holy, new, sinless spirit performed in you, that is none of your actions that, does, that takes you out of being a sinner into being a saint but, and should take you out of sin but will never take you out of all sinfulness and sinful acts or carnality. You have to put them off. So, this is the invisible body of Christ. And the invisible church, if you can call it a church, I prefer to say assembly. The invisible assembly of the saints of the Lord. So the holy people of God today are invisible. We are a new nation, but an invisible nation as such. We're connected to all the other citizens of heaven all around the world as one nation, and nobody can see us all together as one nation. It's impossible, isn't it? And even if we join together in one vast concourse, who's to know that there are not those who are not true believers amongst us? They were amongst the early churches, and so they would be amongst us. So you're not looking at the pure and holy Church of Jesus Christ, you're looking at a whole bunch of people who include those who are of the pure and holy Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So today it has to do with a spiritual nation, a spiritual people, spiritual matters, people who have become spiritual because they're born again of the Spirit of God. You would hope there would be some preacher somewhere who preaches 100% truth of the Word of God, like looking for a needle in the haystack. When we 
we look at the Old Testament, we have to see it as full of battles. It's full of wars. Full of bloodshed. Full of evil. Full of idolatry. Do you read it? I hope so. And when we look at the Old Testament, the battles are natural. Every one of them. When we look at the New Testament, the battles are spiritual. Because the Apostle Paul said decidedly in Ephesians 6, we wrestle not with flesh and blood. And our battle is a wrestling. Because we're not exactly standing in a, a very bad battle situation where 24 hours a day there's watches against us or fallen angels or evil spirits or sinful men. It's not a continual one that will happen one day. And it says also that the devil, as a roaring lion, goes around seeking whom he can devour. That's any of us. And it also says, and this is our real battle, fight the good fight of faith. The churches are not fighting the good fight of faith when they have aligned themselves with Israel and the Jews. We need to repent. That's the awakening we need, if you want a third awakening. That awakening has to be one of repentance for the situations you've got yourselves into, as I was in, in following Israel. But I never did look forward to spending any time on earth. All my Christian life, if I thought of, was one day I'm going to heaven. Never thought of coming back, even though I followed that doctrine. When we think of the New Testament, <coughs> we think of supernatural interventions, as well as the Old Testament that had supernatural interventions. Now here's one in the book of Isaiah 38. There was a king of Judah called Hezekiah. And there were certain opponents that were coming against him in chapter 36. Sennacherib, king of the Assyrians, came against all the fortified cities of Judah. Forty-six of them he captured. Do you know where we know that from? From an ancient Assyrian account in some museum or some library that tells the events surrounding the siege of Jerusalem it had been and included 46 fortified cities in Judah had already been taken by Sennacherib. So King Hezekiah in Jerusalem must have been very frightened. And then he was threatened further from the emissaries of the king Sennacherib, you know. <laughs> uh, I had a poem in school. The Assyrians came down like a hat in the fight, and there's something with cohorts were gleaming in scarlet and gold. That was about this chapter in Isaiah, but our school teacher didn't tell us that. Now, as the, as the chapter reads on, we come to the fact that they, they were faced with absolute destruction. And God did his act. And he said in v chapter 37 of verse 35, I will protect this city to save it for my own sake, not for their sake, and for my servant David's sake, because he had to have a people through whom the Lord Jesus Christ could be born. And so Sennacherib comes, and this is what happened in verse 36. The angel of the Lord, you know who that is? The word of God, Christ, appearing on earth to do his work of destruction. He who is the Lord Jesus Christ. The angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of these Syrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, 
they discovered all the dead bodies. Now you can read about it elsewhere. But this is what happened to Sennacherib. As he was worshipping in the house of Nisroch his god, his son struck him down with the sword. So you see, God worked so supernaturally that there was no vi visible hand or invi uh, uh, doing anything except the angel of the Lord. But then he used supernaturally the sons of Sennacherib and they of course were visible. In 2 Kings chapter 6 in the King James Version Elijah was in a certain city with his servant and the servant was frightened but not Elijah because round about the city there were the horses and the chariots of the enemy. And then the servant comes to him and says, Master, what do we do? Oh, look at all the soldiers out there. And then this is what Elijah said. Do not fear, for those who are with us are greater in number than those who are with them. Who was with Elijah? Not very many soldiers. Who were they? Then Elijah prayed and said, Lord, open the eyes of the servant and let him see. And the Lord opened his eyes. He saw into the supernatural, invisible realm. He did not see anything visible. It only became visible to him because the Lord opened his spiritual eyes that he could see maybe through his natural eyes what was there in the atmosphere of the heavens all around them. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he was now able to see and he beheld the mountain full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. These were the, enemy, were the armies of the Lord. The heavenly hosts. Angels. Protecting them. And so then the Syrians, who were against him, marched against the city. And Elisha prays, Lord, strike these people with blindness. He performed a miracle because the Holy Ghost came upon him. And the God struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And so he came down to them. Oh, he used subterfuge of the Jews that they use today. And he was never a Jew. He, he, he said to them, he said, Ah, oh, this is not the city. They're all blind, you see. He said, not, This is not the way to it. Follow me. I will bring you to this man you seek. He was he himself, actually, Elisha. So Elisha said to them, Come on. And he led them away to Samaria. And when they arrived in Samaria, which was some distance away, Elisha said, Lord, open their eyes. And they opened, and they could see. And they were in the midst of Samaria. And that's the way Elisha and his servant were saved. So God performed spiritual acts and spiritual miracles that acted physically in their physical kingdom, in their physical people, for their physical people, and for the anointed prophet of God. We think of the time Peter was in prison. The people of God were praying. And an angel came to Peter, took the chains off his feet and arms. The door opened all by itself. And out went Peter, following the angel. And he didn't really think he was leaving the prison. He thought he was in a vision. Well, he was in a vision. 
<laughs> that he was in an actuality of the vision. He was walking and following the angel and didn't realize he was walking himself out of the vision, in the vision, out of the prison. So he goes to the door of the house where they're all praying, knocks. The servant comes to the door and she's so thrilled, she sees Peter. She runs inside and says to these praying people who are believing, Oh, Peter's loose. He's outside. Oh, they said, no, he can't be. He's in prison still. So much for their faith that was going to happen. But it happened without their faith. It happened because it was the will of God. And you know what they said? It's his angel. You see? They thought an angel that looked after Peter in the prison was manifesting himself as as Peter. Well, of course, it wasn't the case. It was Peter himself. So God did those supernatural things. And then there was uh, Paul. He had a vision. And he said to the people the next day, The Lord stood by me, and the ship will not sink with all the people on board. It will sink and all the people will not be drowned. The Lord stood by him and told him. So we need to realize that our attacks are spiritually motivated. We're getting attacks all the time. Now I wouldn't have said that once because mostly the attacks are so invisible we don't realize they're happening especially if it's wrong doctrines. We go on for years believing this end time stuff as I did. Didn't realize I was under attack by demons presenting me through the preachers and books with the doctrines of their own, with the doctrines of demons. And maybe some watcher was working and some a strong angel, they attacked us. They're still doing it today in different angles of our life. But you see, we need to wrestle. And we can only wrestle and continue to wrestle. Number one, to do what it says at the end of those verses in Ephesians 6 where it tells us to put on the, the whole armor of God, which is to pray at all times in the Holy Ghost. Even then, that's not enough. We have to have the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, our loins girt with truth. How can you resist the lies of Satan in, in our churches and that we listen to and have even proclaimed ourselves? How can we discern them if we are not girt about with the total truth of the Word of God? You would hope there would be some preacher somewhere who preaches 100% truth of the Word of God like looking for a needle in the haystack. Bless all the preachers. <laughs> Bless us all with truth, Lord, is what we, sh we should be saying. Then we have to have the sword of the Spirit. We have to attack. We have to resist, but we have to attack. We have to act against the error. We have to act against the assaults of station. The Church of Jesus Christ must act very strongly against this Jewish intrusion against this Israel uh, error and de demonism, against the witchcraft of is Israel, against their idolatry and paganism, against the Kabbalah and Talmud. We have to act. We have to wield the sword of the Spirit. We have to attack, brothers and sisters. Get up and leave them and attack them, is what the Bible says. And so we are under spiritual attack. Now here is a little example of the attack. In Revelation chapter 12, there was a great sign in heaven and so forth. And then in verse 3, Behold a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven crowns. His tail drew one-third of the stars of heaven 
and threw them down to earth. Most churches believe that is Satan, he's in heaven years ago with all his angels who were um, amounted to one third of heaven's angels. But God, he, had, he had a fight with God and God won and threw him out of heaven with all his angels and they get that only from their wrong interpretation of Isaiah chapter 14 which was about that evil watcher evil angel Nebuchadnezzar who fell. So what is this about? People are following Gnosticism because that was a Jewish myth. I knew that years ago. That was a Jewish myth. The Apostle Peter said and Paul also don't follow Jewish myths. Well, quit following the Jewish myth. Because the dragon basically is the Roman Empire. And being in the heavens is to do with the atmosphere of the earth. Now that Rome will fall, according to this chapter, will fall in their lifetime, according to this chapter and this book, because the book is about, the majority of it, the things that are about to happen. And it started happening in their lifetime. And almost immediately, as those words were written, there were some repercussions. The Roman Empire that were being apparent to the, to the believers, to the Christians. And so the red dragon is the Roman Empire. And those kings are named in history and we have done a teaching on that but we're going to repeat it. Then when we look at chapter 13 he sees a beast in verse 2 he sees a beast coming out of the sea and he sees other things there but we won't go into them except to say this the beast coming out of the sea is the god Neptune that the Romans worshipped. So who is he speaking about? He's speaking about the greater activity of the Watcher put in place by, by the demons, by whoever is in charge of that area amongst the demons. And he's speaking about the evil that's going to in increase directed against the people of God of that time. And so the beast at that time was the completed ten Caesars that are mentioned in chapter 12 and it represented the Roman Caesars because of course the God behind the Romans and the Caesars that came out of the sea was only Neptune, not Jupiter, not Saturn, not Caesar. Caesar was their God also. So you see how we have to realign our thinking in accordance with history, fulfilled prophecies of the Old Testament and in accordance with what the whole Bible says about the matter very, very clearly. And our major problem is all the mis missing scriptures. Now we don't realize that there is not identified at all in the whole of the Bible one supernaturally indwelt being as the antithesis of Jesus Christ, eternal God and eternal holiness and eternal righteousness, being indwelt within a man. It's not possible. Jesus Christ is internal. Nothing that would indwell a man is ever eternal. Satan was not eternal. He's created. 
So there, on that first point alone, you can't have the antithesis of Jesus Christ in a person of the Antichrist, and that is what they teach. That's just the beginning of the teaching. But what we don't realize and haven't realized is Throughout the whole of history, there have always been these strong characters, generally male, they can be female. What about Cleopatra? I would say she was a watcher, a female. And there was one female Caesar, and her name was Irene. Sadly, for me, but she was a watcher, without a doubt. Every Caesar was one of those watchers. Incarnated in a man, or, or generally, or a woman. So, if there had been a lot of them, they're all Antichrist. And the Apostle John said in 1 John chapter 2, verse 7, many Antichrists have gone out into the world. Many! So how can you say there is the Antichrist when there are many? It's impossible. There will not be the Antichrist. There will be an Antichrist that is happening all the time in history, even today. There are many of them all over the world, indwelt by these evil forces of the Watchers, the Fallen Angels, the Nephilim, the Aljo, the Giants, as well as their sinfulness that all of mankind has on account of our being born in the darkness of sin. So when we consider that, we come to the end of the world. And we only come to the end of the world when we get to chapter 20. Because the thousand years is an indeterminate time. We who believe in Christ are, are living and reigning with him in amongst those thousand years. Not every one of us a thousand years. Every one of us an indeterminate time. Seventy years, fifty years, twenty years, ninety years, five years, five, one hundred and five indeterminate. And that has proceeded from the time of Christ and is still ensuing. We're in that thousand year period. Because it's a, tip, a typical quotation. It's not an actual number of years. It's in my book, which I wish you would download and read and study, called End Time in Israel on revirene.org, O-R-G. You, you can have it for free. It sets it all out. Uh, uh, to a large extent. <laughs> Not totally. Never totally. And so we have not an antichrist that everybody's looking for. Will never happen. We have Antichrists, plural, many of them. And as to whether there will be one strong Antichrist, it is not stated anywhere in the Bible that there will be, because Second Thessalonians chapter 2 has to do, second, chap second chapter of Thessalonians has to do with some mystery figure who would appear in their lifetime and that was Nero, which is what the early believers believed. But when we come to chapter 20 of Revelation, we come to something in time that concerns the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ because it says in verse 7, and when the thousand years are finished, Satan will be released from his prison. And he will come out 
to deceive the nations which are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. Now everybody says, in my day, Gog was Germany and Magog was Russia. And look how old I am. I think today they might have reversed it. I think they might say Gog and Magog is Russia. I'm not sure what they say. To start off with, Gog and Magog are the king and a city that used to exist in Turkey that does not exist anymore. Now whether they existed at the time of the writing of this book, I have not looked up. But I certainly found out that they were the king and the city of northwestern Turkey as we know it today and it does not exist today. So Gog and Magog are not at the four corners of the earth. So it is not about any natural nation. It's not about Russia. It's not about Germany. It's not about some nations of Europe coming up against the city of Jerusalem. Now it says that Satan will gather the nations together to the war. There are so many nations in the world, even if a third of the population is removed, think of all the nations and all the soldiers, naturally, who could be gathered together to fight in the land of Israel. Rubbish, isn't it? An impossibility. How many millions are in the land armies? How many are in the air forces? Where are they going to fly from? Well, today it's sending missiles halfway across the world. So there's no need for any soldiers. So the Bible distinctly says that it was the nations and it distinctly says their number is as the sand of the sea, innumerable. And it says they marched over the breadth of the land. Of course, everybody says Israel. So how can those innumerable millions march over the land of Israel? Where are the ships going to dock? How can they all fit in? And they're going to surround the camp of the saints. Anybody who lives in Jerusalem were there to be a millennium, and this is before the millennium, or some people might say it's after it. Whatever it is, how can they be called saints? The saints have gone to heaven. And according to their theory, the saints come down to reign with Christ still in their immortal, glorified, heavenly bodies. So they're not camping there, are they? You, we, you would not be camping anywhere in your heavenly body, not on this earth. So they can't be there. So the Jews who are going to be there, they say, have accepted Christ as Messiah, but they are still not saints. They're still Jews. It cannot be both. Because the Bible says in Galatians, I think it's about chapter 3, there is neither Jew nor Gentile in Christ. And every epistle of the New Testament where it says it states we are saints. So no Jew is a saint. No, no Gentile is a oh, sorry. No Jew is a Jew, no Gentile is a Gentile. But no Jew can be a saint if he's living in Jerusalem. So who are they? They've come down around the beloved city. We'll read the rest of it to find out. Fire came down from God out of heaven and they were consumed. When you read through the whole of the Bible, when you read the book of Enoch, the book of Jubilees, and the other missing books of the Bible, fire denotes destruction from God on spirits. 
So the spirits of Satan and his army, the spirits that are in the unbelievers of the world, because the unbelievers of the world will come against the believers, and they are indwelt by the evil spirits, and it won't be the believers of the unbelievers who will be destroyed by fire from them. So this is about some kind of a spiritual battle, and it does not include human beings as such. It's, it's spirit talk. It's supernatural talk. It's about things in the invisible realm that are going to work through ordinary people, and they're not going to work against an ordinary, natural camp. You don't need millions to come against the small city of, Jer of Jerusalem, which is what they say will be the center. You just need a few thousand if they have the right armaments. You only need one or two. So these are innumerable as the sand of the sea. So who is the camp of the saints? The body of Christ, the household of God. They are the saints. It would appear that at the end of time, at the end of the world, there will be great persecution against believers. And then it says, the devil who deceived them, these evil people who are acting, was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the pro false prophet are all so. Now the beast were the Roman emperors, Caesars. If you read the book of Enoch and Jubilees, you will see that there is fire already where they are. Now the Bible doesn't clearly, clearly state the divisions of the fire and its existence in those books and here even between this fire and the fire of hell. Both are in two separate places. So nothing's particularly 100% clear. And it seems at that time, those people in the end will be sent into the lake of fire. But according to the other scriptures that we read about, where the judgment seat of God is, it doesn't happen like that at all. So let scripture interpret scripture. And let us take from this scripture the only spiritual and supernatural conclusion we can come to that is great persecution against the believers. Now persecution is going on all over the world right now. And uh, we feel for them because naturally we would not want to endure it. The early saints in a way look forward to it. To do that I think needs the grace of God. But their attitude was but my home is not here. This kingdom of earth doth not belong to me. I have nothing to do with the kingdom of this world. I belong to the kingdom of God. Let me get there. Jesus is there. That was their attitude. So when we understand all these things we've been listening to today, let us have another look at the Bible. Hour after hour, day after day. And you are welcome to watch all my videos. Uh, there would be probably 30 or 40 on these matters that are the later ones. And I know they're time consuming. But you, I trust, can take the time to have a peep, have a look, and to ponder about it, to search the scriptures. At least listen. At least watch and weigh it all up as we are expected to do. And God bless us all, in Jesus' name. Amen.